All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining. We're going to get started here. Uh, my name is Sam Furio. I will be moderating this session this evening. Uh, I'm the outreach coordinator for the Maryland Department of the Environment's Building Decarbonization Team. Thank you for joining the third BEPS informational session within a series of four in August and early September. Tonight, we will be discussing clean buildings for all, leaving no one behind. And just so you know, this session is being recorded and uploaded to the BEPS YouTube playlist, which you can find in the chat feature at this time. If you missed any of our previous informational sessions over the last three, three weeks, you can view the recordings on this playlist as well. All resources shared this evening uh, in the chat feature will be posted in the description in the description of the YouTube video. The chat has been disabled. If you have a question, please submit it in the Q&A feature, which is accessible via the triangle, circle, square button in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. If you hover your mouse over the button, it will say activities. So when we get to the Q&A portion for the evening, that's where you can submit your questions. And again, uh, the chat feature has been disabled for viewers. The, we will be submitting resources in the chat. And when you're logging in, you might receive a prompt from, from Google Meet saying to raise your hand to ask a question. Uh, but I just want to reiterate, to ask a question, we are going to submit them in the Q&A feature in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen, the Activities button. So tonight, we will also be using a live poll feature, which can be accessed from the same circle, triangle, square button where you find the Q&A. It's the Do It All button. And we will notify you when all those polling opportunities become available. So I'd first like to provide a run of show for the evening. We will begin with an overview of climate pollution reduction through building decarbonization and an overview of the benefits of this work in terms of jobs, energy cost savings, and health benefits. Afterwards, we'll turn it over to Becky Price from the Maryland Energy Administration, who manages the Clean Buildings Hub, to provide an overview of the Hub's important work. Lastly, we will be answering questions from the Q&A feature. We will work to address as many questions as possible this evening, and if we cannot get to all submitted questions, we will work to address them in future engagement sessions. The Maryland Department of the Environment published Maryland's Climate Pollution Reduction Plan in December of 2023, as required by the 2022 Climate Solutions Now Act. The plan describes how Maryland can reduce statewide greenhouse gas emissions by 60% by 2031 to achieve its near-term climate goals and place the state on a path to achieve net zero emissions by 2045. New policies will transition the state from the fossil fuel era of the past to a clean energy future while delivering not only cleaner air, but net economic benefits to Maryland. In order to achieve, excuse me, got ahead of myself. In order to achieve Maryland's ambitious climate action goals, the Climate Pollution Reduction Plan outlines policies across the entire economy, including electricity, transportation, buildings, industry, wastes, agriculture, forestry, and land use. Tonight, we're diving into buildings and how related policies can deliver clean buildings for all. Direct fuel use in the building sector accounted for 16% of Maryland's GHG emissions in 2020, according to the Maryland Greenhouse Gas Emissions Inventory, or Maryland's Climate Action Scorecard. This includes burning fuel for space heating, water heating, cooking, and industri <clears throat> industrial heating processes. Buildings also use almost all of the electricity consumed in the state, so improving energy efficiency to reduce electricity consumption and fuel use are key strategies for addressing climate change and reducing energy costs for Marylanders. 
there are a number of existing policies and programs that, as you can see on the screen, are modeled to reduce emissions in the dotted line titled current policies, but not enough to reach Maryland's targets. Maryland will need new policies to further support greenhouse gas emissions reductions from the building sector. Importantly, reducing climate change pollution not only benefits the environment, but it creates jobs. Upgrading a boiler to a heat pump cannot be outsourced. In total, Maryland's climate pollution reduction plan is estimated to create an additional 27,000 jobs between now and 2031. The Climate Pollution Reduction Plan is modeled to save Maryland households $2,600 annually and even more if switching from oil or propane to heat pumps and electric vehicles. And thanks to the Inflation Reduction Act, which just celebrated its second year, there are increased incentives and rebates for making improvements around your house or building. In total, Maryland's Climate Pollution Reduction Plan is estimated to increase personal income by $2.5 billion and grow Maryland's gross domestic product by $5.3 billion between now and 2031. Air quality and public health outcomes will improve for everyone, especially people living in historically underserved and overburdened communities. Maryland's Climate Pollution Reduction Plan can achieve broad benefits, but requires an all of government and an all of society approach to achieve its objectives. One important way to get involved is through the Maryland Commission on Climate Change, which advises the governor and the General Assembly on ways to mitigate the causes of, prepare for, and adapt to the consequences of climate change. The commission has eight working groups, including the new Just Transition Working Group, which was created to advise the commission on issues and opportunities for workforce development and training related to energy efficient measures, renewable energy, and other clean technologies. The working group meets monthly, and the next meeting will be next week on Friday, August 30th. So the Just Transition Working Group is guided by the six principles here on the slide. But we know that there are investments needed to transition from fossil fuels to the clean buildings of the future. So with that in mind, I'm pleased to turn it over to Becky Price from the Maryland Energy Administration to introduce the Maryland Clean Buildings Hub. Hey, Sam, can you hear me? We can hear you just fine. Awesome. Um, so we're going to kick it off with a, a poll. Um, just I know it's a, a Thursday night and we want folks to be energized. So um, I, I'm not seeing. OK, there it is. Um, so how familiar are you with clean building financing and funding? Um, three easy options, not familiar, familiar, or you'd consider yourself an expert. Um, just kind of like to know where folks are starting from. But anyhow, um, thank you so much, Sam. And um, thank you all for, for being here tonight, for spending your Thursday nights with us. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, my name is Becky. And I, like Sam said, I'm an employee over at the Maryland Energy Administration, which is Maryland State Energy Office. Um, so I'm going to spend the next 15 or so minutes discussing a new initiative we're working on over at MEA um, called the Maryland Clean Buildings Hub. But before I before I, I launch into what the hub is, I, I kind of want to give some context. So it was actually created in the Climate Solutions Now Act. Um, this, so the same legislation that created the Building Energy Performance Standard. Um, and the thinking there, the, the legislatures that were penning that law understood that the that the BEPS is is ambitious yet achievable um, and that there aren't that many states or jurisdictions ahead of us. Um, we were actually only the third state in the country to enact a policy like this, a, a BEPS. 
Um, so they wanted to have some sort of infrastructure in place to help building owners subject to the BEPS understand how they how they get to 2040. Um, so how they get to that net zero um, target, which led them to to add a line at the end of the, uh, I don't know, 100 so page bill creating the, the Maryland Clean Buildings Hub. Um, so I, I think about the hub as serving two kind of primary needs. Um, first, helping building owners building owners understand how to decarbonize. So what are the steps and measures that I should take as a building owner to reduce my emissions um, and increase my energy efficiency? And then secondly, and perhaps more importantly, how the heck do I fund and finance all of this? Um, and, and basically, I think we, we know you're busy and we want to help take some of that administrative research burden off of you. Um, which leads me to my working vision statement for the initiative. Um, next slide, please. The hub envisions a state where every building owner has access to the information, resources, and funding and financing it needs to become highly energy efficient and to eliminate on-site fossil fuel usage in a cost-effective manner. Um, and you'll, you'll notice the little bitmoji that MDE made for me that I find very cute. Um, so you'll notice that uh, BEPS is not explicitly mentioned in this vision statement, and, and that was intentional. Um, while the BEPS was, I believe, the impetus for, for the legislators uh, creating the, the Maryland Clean Buildings Hub, uh, much of the education and resources that, that we want to provide to you all are going to be relevant to so many building types um, that, that may not be covered by the BEPS. Um, so we wanted to keep it higher level and broader. Um, yeah. So next slide. Um, I want to give credit where credit is due. And I actually saw that someone from uh, DC's hub is on the line. So so hi, Mary. <laughs> um, this sort of hub model um, in which um, building owners are sort of assisted um, with their building decarbonization journey um, is not unique to Maryland. Um, you know, candidly, we actually stole the idea for some, from some other jurisdictions who came before us. So hubs have been created in, in multiple cities across the country um, that have BEPS requirements. So including our neighbors in DC, uh, New York City, um, as well as Seattle. So I believe this, the Maryland Clean Buildings Hub will be the, the first kind of statewide hub that, that I know of at least. The other two states that have building performance standards are Colorado and um, Washington State were, were before us and a couple others have come after us. Um, and these hubs all have slightly different models and levels of engagement with their respective communities. Um, and there's so much you know, lessons to learn from, from what they've been doing and then how can we adjust for, for Maryland's needs. So right now we're sort of thinking about um, how we're gonna achieve our, our vision um, with kind of three, three tranches. Um, the first two I sort of see as being two sides of the same coin. So first and foremost, educator. So we're going to point folks to where they need to go um, through creating our own re resources, as well as pointing folks to excellent resources that already exist. Again, I'm going to call out Mary um, from IMT's um, hub in, in DC. They have excellent resources. Why reinvent the wheel? Would love to point you to stuff that they've already created just sort of an example there. Uh, secondly, convener. So um, along with these educational offerings, I, I think it's it's really important to be doing this all together. And we wanna create opportunities for building owners and stakeholders in general uh, to learn from each other. Um, I'm, really, I'm really in love with kind of a cohort model that we wanna explore, um, getting building owners of similar types. So just for example, a hospital or commercial office buildings, um, to learn from each other um, in a kind of curriculum fo format. Um, but beyond the, the cohort format, uh, we're going to be hosting a lot of topic-specific webinars, trainings, workshops, and other events that um, allow for dialogue between a building owner and an expert, um, as well as dialogue among each other. Peer-to-peer um, -peer learning is, is important and, and um, you know, you all are living this and we, we think that you you have important uh, stories and uh, insight to share with each other. And then finally, um, somewhat facetiously coined, <laughs> coined the hub as Maryland's building czar. 
Um, and that's kind of unique to the fact that we're housed within Maryland Energy Administration, which um, we provide grants and loans to help stimulate, um, you know, catalyze market growth um, in the clean energy sector. So um, just a little, I'll, I'll get into more detail on our grant and loan opportunities in a second, um, but know that, that the funding and financing we provide over at MEA is not necessarily static. Um, we're constantly tweaking our grant programs every fiscal year um, to better serve the market. And I think um, the hub is, is going to be cool because we're going to be a liaison to the building community through all these, you know, education and outreach opportunities. And we're going to take that feedback um, and work with our grant program managers to, to see how we can tweak our programs and in the future. So that's something that I'm can't, like quite excited about. Uh, next slide. Um, this slide is is really meant to to reiterate uh, what I've what I've already said uh, that while that hub is housed within MEA, um, we're pulling together expertise and, and capabilities from a really broad ecosystem of entities that are in the building decarbonization space. Um, whether that's you know other agencies that provide funding or um, you know, a, a nonprofit group that has a really cool resource or energy service providers that can, you know, give you the skinny on, on what you should look for um, when you're choosing a vendor for, for an audit or, or, you know, a large retrofit project. Um, so know that um, we're, we're bigger than the sum of our parts is what I like to say. Uh, next slide. So like I've said, funding and financing, we're, we're hearing loud and clear is um, what what you folks want to, or what we think folks want to hear about. Um, the logos on the screen right now are, are just meant to illustrate the, the breadth of funding and financing available to Marylanders right now. Uh, kind of emphasis on right now that this is a, a fluid situation. Obviously we still have IRA money, poor Inflation Reduction Act, sorry, I should not use acronyms. Um, pouring into the state and we're, we're, you know, creating programs that will be launched in years to come. So, um, but, but really we understand that there's so many sources um, and they're obviously not available under one roof. Um, so we, the charge is we want to like demystify these for you and provide as much education for you as possible on like, what does 179D mean? Like, help me understand my empower maryland utility incentives etc what is cpace um so that that's going to be um what i expect to be the a main priority in in our um educational materials uh next slide so i i you know we've got a captive audience i, I do want to spotlight some funding um including some funding in um within mea um we could probably, and we will at some point, dedicate entire webinars to, to each of these. There's there's so much there. Um, so I'm going to stay really high level tonight. Um, but do note that MEA actually at the moment is working on finalizing our fiscal year 2025 uh, grant and loan program offerings, um, which we're going to roll out over the next few months. Um, first one, commercial, industrial, and agricultural grant program. Um, we provide grants for energy efficiency and newly electrification investments in these property types. This also, yes, does include multifamily data centers, nonprofits, um, and projects need to, uh, proposed projects rather, um, would need to um, include two or more energy conservation measures in their projects. So could be, I don't know, HVAC controls, um, air sealing, um uh, lighting um you could even do retro commissioning um and they must achieve energy performance that exceeds uh that of of the state's minimum codes and standards um this program will fund up to 85 percent of the project cost and um we're we're going to be we we just um finalized our our fiscal year 24 um grantees and we'll, we'll be publishing what those projects were um, so I think it's a it's a cool way to kind of see um, what what can be funded. Secondly, um, we actually have one loan financing program here at MEA. Um, the Jane E. Lawton loan uh, provides low cost 
financing for projects that result in significant energy savings. So we over at the agency say that it's it's the financing equivalent to the, the CINA grant. Um, so they're actually often stacked and we encourage applicants to apply to both to stack them. So uh, we provide below market rates for commercial you know, businesses, multifamily, um, that's a 3% interest rate. Nonprofits are given 2% interest rate and local governments and state agencies are given a 0% interest rate. Um, so cool offering. I feel like not a lot of people know about that. Um, for the local governments in the house, we have the Maryland Smart Energy Communities Grant Program um, and that funds, again, energy conservation measures in um, for local governments, so counties, municipalities. Um, fourth, gosh, this is a long list. Um, <laughs> some of you may know that uh, back in February, our Governor Moore announced a carve out from Maryland's Strategic Energy Investment Fund uh, for building electrification projects in a few uh, kind of key building types, uh, schools, hospitals, and other community buildings uh, located in low and moderate income communities. So our MEA staff is, is working diligently to prop that program up. We've got a little under 50 million to distribute um, for heat pumps um, and then other you know energy efficient building shells, other ECMs. So um, we'll be providing a status update um, on that in the next few months. Um, and you can obviously periodically check ME's website and I will plug uh, the hubs, like how you contact the hub and um, hopefully that's how you'll be getting your information. Um, and finally, um, Inflation Reduction Act rebates. If I had a nickel for every time I was asked about these. Um, so as many of you know, the IRA created two rebate programs aimed at decarbonizing single and multifamily residential buildings. So first, the home energy efficiency rebates, and secondly, the home electric and appliance rebate programs. Uh, so as Maryland State Energy Office, MEA is responsible for designing and implementing these programs, which are bringing in almost 70 million uh, for Marylanders, which is super exciting. Next slide. Um, so the IRA did provide a blueprint and some guidance, um, but there's a lot of decisions that that the agency MEA needs to make um, in how it wants to distribute this money. So we're working on submitting our full application to the Department of Energy, um, and we're going to be ready to start distributing money um, in beginning of 2025. Um, unfortunately, I can't give too many details because that team is still working on answering, um, you know, how how these programs are going to be structured. Um, but know that the rebates will be up to amount the amounts pictured on the screen. Um, and we did want to add that um, in the climate plan that, that Sam mentioned his portion, um, it, it recommended that Maryland work to maintain funding for electrification rebates after that 70 million runs out. and. And just know that we are, you know, all of us advocates are working hard to make that a reality. Um, so with, with the rebates, um, MEA does have a federal funding page that I believe um, my colleague is going to drop into the chat. So you can periodically check that. And then um, the hub will also, if you if you sign up for our, um, you know, newsletter, et cetera, which I'll, I'll plug in a second, um, you'll, you'll be... Um, plugged into to when those become available. So to kind of close out this, this funding um, portion, I, I really want to reiterate that we give out money at the Maryland Energy Administration um, and we want you to apply or tell, tell folks that you think are eligible to apply. Um, and the hub is going to be organizing webinars at later dates where we do deep dives into each of these programs. Um, you know, we could definitely spend a whole hour talking about um, what would make a successful application, what the criteria is, and maybe even have some previous grantees talk about um, the, the savings that they've accrued from, from their projects. Next slide. So I, again, I, I started talking about, like in the beginning, I talked about how, you know, our goals are two-prong. A, 
you know, help you figure out how to fund and finance things. But then what do you, where do you, how do you even decarbonize? Um, and so these are some of the questions that, that we've been hearing from building owners. And um, I like to think of the hub, a phrase I've been using is the first mile of technical assistance. So even if if you don't even know what questions to ask to start your, your building decarbonization journey, we want to prompt you and then help you find the answers. So while while we cannot perform um, you know an audit on your building, we can we can help you you know learn what the what the types of audits are and where you can you can go um, get an audit and how you pay for it. Um, so so yeah, just know that the hub's goal is to curate and convene experts um, to assist you. And next slide. So I've talked about this hub for the last 10 minutes, um, and, and I'm sure some of you are like likely wondering, like, where does it actually exist? Um, may seem a little bit nebulous. Um, so in the short term, it, the newsletter is going to be the main conduit of communication. Um, I, I believe my colleague is going to drop that, that sign up in the chat. Um, so we're going to aim to publish quarterly, although I already feel like I have so much content that it may, may be every other month or even every month at some point with um, relevant announcements. So funding and financing announcements, you know, trainings, events, um, agency updates, regulation updates, et cetera, case studies. Um, so you know, shameless, shameless plug to subscribe to that newsletter. Um, and then we are working towards launching our, our own website independent from the Maryland Energy Administration, hopefully by the end of the calendar year. And we, we hope that this website will be kind of your first stop in your building decarb journey and then it'll take you take you other places. <laughs> um, but in the meantime, uh, we've, we've started curating a few pages on MEA's website because um, we know that you guys are eager for information right now. Um, so you'll see that we've started compiling a couple of resources there. Um, and then uh, finally, events, as I've mentioned. So we're, we're gonna be, you know, multi multi-medium in person, um, you know, over over Zoom, hybrid. Uh, we wanna do events where, where you can really engage with, again, experts and, and your peers on, you know, figuring out how, how we get to 2040. Uh, next slide. So if you have any takeaway, well, A, sign up for the newsletter, but but B, um, I hope that I've, I've done a good job in the last you know 10 or so minutes at emphasizing that this initiative is for you. Um, so we've, we've been seeking feedback for, I don't know, the better part of a year from building owners and other stakeholders through an ongoing ongoing stakeholder needs assessment, um, which is is that first link. But um, since you're all here on this wonderful Thursday night, um, I kind of wanted to to just run a one single question um, to sort of see see what types of resources would be helpful to you. Um, so if that would be launched, I think I see it's been launched. Awesome. And yeah, this this one question is, is not a substitute for for answering the full survey, but I I know you are busy, so. Um, cool. Okay. And moving right along to I believe what is my last slide. So how to connect with the hub? Um, email address building.decarbonization at maryland.gov. Um, I think it's what the fifth time I've, I've plugged the newsletter. There's the, the newsletter sign up. Um, and then finally that uh, those those pages on MEA's existing website and, and note that a, a new website will, will come in um, a couple months. So I think that's the end of my presentation for the evening. Now it's time for questions. Go oh, easy on me. Thank you, Becky. Appreciate it. Just dust off my camera here. <laughs> All right, everyone. Well, thank you, Becky, for that 
that nice presentation. And just a reminder, we're, we're going to move into the Q&A portion of the evening. The Q&A feature, if you were joining late, is in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. There's a circle, triangle, square button. Hover over it. It's called Activities. If you've got a question, you can submit it in that Q&A feature now. And we will do our best to address your questions this evening. If we're not able to get to them, uh, we, will, we will work to do so in future engagement sessions. All right. Well, without further ado, let's, let's take a look and see what we got here. All right, Becky, you ready? I think I got a good one here for you. Uh-oh. All right, first one is from Drew. Thank you for this question, Drew. We've got, how would a state agency facilities manager be advised of this program? We have not received anything from the State Department of General Services. Ooh, good question. Um, so MDE, Department of Environment and MEA, um, we're working super closely with, with DGS on, um, you know, both BEPS implementation and compliance, um, as well as, as hub offerings. So I would, I guess I'd suggest that you email um, the, the BEPS email address, which if one of my colleagues could, could throw that in the chat uh, to get more information um, and to allow us to provide some, some contacts and more information. Um, Up in that email in the chat right now. Appreciate that. Yeah, so for the building decarbonization team within MDE, we have our own email. It is beps.mde at maryland.gov, B-E-P-S dot M-D-E at maryland.gov. If you send a message there, you'll probably get me. And if you call 410-537-3183, I'll write that in the chat as well. You're going to get me as well. So you're stuck with me no matter what. But give us a call if you have any questions about BEPS. We'd love to hear from you. All right. Thank you, Drew, for that question. Really great question. All right, moving right along. Ready, Becky? Got another one for you. All right. So this was submitted from, oh, anonymous. A large portion of this process will fall on the contractors and service providers Absolutely. leading the work. What are your plans to both incentivize and streamline this process for these individuals? Great question. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I hope you see me nodding emphatically over here. Um, so thank you so much. Um, yes, agreed that they're key to making this work happen. Um, Again, kind of want to um, talk about some future ideas that I may have. Um, DC um, had a, a con has a contractor incubation program, which I, I went to their graduation a few a few months ago, and I thought it was was super magical. And um, it was an eight week boot camp that um, taught a contractor kind of cohort. I think there was about thirty of them in it um, about about the DC BEPS and how they could prepare themselves for it and how they could, um, you know, submit winning bids for, for work RFP. So that's against like, these are such cool ideas and I want to replicate these in, in the States. So, um, I guess on that, like be patient, but, but, you know, I'm thinking about this a lot. And then, um, just kind of a more general comment that the, the state agencies in Maryland are, are coordinating together through the governor's federal investment team. Um, there's a, there's some grant fund, federal grant funding coming into into Maryland on um, workforce development and, and contractor training. Um, so that's kind of a again a a, a bit of a, a TBD, but we're working on it. And I'm excited to to bring the the contract and service providers into the hub and you know, leverage their expertise and and you know um, so. Subscribe I, again. I think every answer I'm going to end with subscribe to the Hub newsletter, and and uh, we'll we'll give you updates as they roll out. Um, but but 
share ideas. Um, that is that is gold right now. I hope that was a sufficient answer. Thank you, Becky. Appreciate it. All right. And thank you, Anonymous, for that question. Let's keep moving here. All right. One second. Mm -hmm. All right. We've got another one for you. And this, this might be a big one. This one is also from Anonymous. What resources are available for low, moderate income housing? Ooh. So we could have an entire webinar on that one. So again, it will, will be quite high level here. Um, but it's good to know that, that, that folks want to know this information. So um, I will, I do want to make it clear that in Maryland, we have the Department of Housing and Community Development, so DHCD which is the primary point of contact for um, affordable multifamily housing in Maryland. Um, they've got such great expertise and experience with weatherization contractors, um, you know, federal housing funds like, like WAP, weatherization authorization program, um, and relationships with, with the developers and owners. So um, DHCD does, does have a, a one-stop shop model to their, their energy programs, um, whereby, from my understanding, a prospective grantee can submit a single application for multiple um, energy and weatherization program offerings. Um, so we are working closely with them on synergies and, and how we can kind of cross promote and, and how I can, you know, adequately kind of characterize their programs. But um, I'll quickly kind of run through a few resources. And again, each of these we could spend hour, two hours talking about, but um, they do have a greenhouse gas reduction program over at DHCD, which provides grants to projects that replace fossil fuel equipment with electrical electric alternatives. Um, and projects actually have to be 35,000 square feet or larger to qualify. So this is, um, this is a BEPS compliance pipeline as I see it. Um, they also have, um, uh, so those who pay into, um, those who are in, in um, the Empower utility territories. So, um, you know, your big investor owned utilities, BGE, Pepco, Delmarva, Smeco, Atomic Edison, um, um, rate payers pay into, um, into that through a surcharge on their, on their utility bill. Um, which then, you know, those those funds are then um, given back to the community in terms of um, incentives, rebates, et cetera. So the market the market rate incentives for for market rate housing um, go through the utilities, and then the the incentive carve out for the affordable housing community goes through DHCD. So they have an empower program which provides funding to uh, projects to to reduce um, energy um energy consumption um so there's that program um oh my gosh what else they have a, a net zero loan program so they provide low interest loans for um construction or deep retrofits um of net zero uh properties um there's also federal um assistance so the federal Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, has a resilient retrofit program that was created in the IRA um, that provides um, owners of HUD-assisted multifamily, so, you know, think Section 8 housing, um, with capital to reduce carbon emissions, make efficiency improvements, even um, incorporating renewables, um, actually, and even uh, resilience measures, which is, which is super neat. Um, and they have kind of tranches of, of funding available. Um, so, and then um, I'll lastly add that um, Maryland's qualified allocation plan um, was amended in 2024 to require new construction, gut rehab, and adaptive reuse projects um, that leverage the low-income housing tax credit um, to be fully electric. So that was really exciting that that is aligning with, with our new BEPS reality. So again, that was really high level, um, but 
um, I'll, I'll work with DHCD in the future to um, co-brand webinars and other trainings and, and such. Thank you, Becky. That was a great question from Anonymous again. All right, moving right along. And uh, just a reminder, because I saw a couple people join just in the last few minutes while Becky was answering that last question. If you have any uh, questions for for Becky, manager of the Clean Buildings Hub, uh, we you can submit them in the Q and A feature of this webinar, which is in the bottom right hand corner. It's the square, circle, triangle button uh, labeled activities. You just scroll up to Q and A, and you can submit your question there. And again. Uh, we appreciate everyone's question. We're going to do our best to get to as many as we can this evening. And uh, if not, we'll we'll work to address them in future sessions. Or you can contact us uh, with yeah. your questions as well. So you got yeah. Becky's contact information. And also, we dropped the building decarbonization team's contact information if you have anything pertaining to the building energy performance standards. So with that. Moving right along again. Let's see here, what do we got? All right, this one is from Jason. Thanks for your question, Jason. Is Maryland Energy Administration and Maryland Department of the Environment working with the Maryland Codes Administration to ensure new buildings are constructed to comply versus leaving new building owners out of compliance from the start? Good question. Um, so yes, we are working with the um, Labor Codes Administration. Um, our energy code in Maryland right now does does not require electrification. We 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 do see that as as a as a gap. Um, so we're we're doing what we can to educate. Um, building owners or, or, or builders that this is a requirement or that that BEPS is is coming. Sorry, I was um, so, um, but yes, we are working with them. They know um, there's gonna be a lot of education needed there. All right, thanks for that question, Jason. And moving right along. Next one we got, looks like it's from Matt. Thanks for being here, Matt. Are there any studies showing how this electrification of buildings will affect the electric grid? And is the grid ready to handle this increased load or are there plans to upgrade the grid? I love this question because um, the Climate Solutions Now Act um, actually had a provision that required the Maryland Public Service Commission to study this exact issue. And that was one of the first tasks I had um, when I joined MEA about a year ago was to sit on that, that working group, which is a very dynamic, uh, impassioned group of, group of folks. Um, so this study that was, it was published in December um, and I'm happy to follow up with the link to that study. Um, but it found that efficient electrification of buildings, so, so keyword efficient um, and vehicles, will um, require only modest electric grid investments that are actually like at or below the, the investments we've made in the past 40 years. Um, it was, it was a, quite a, a, a pleasing um, uh, conclusion to that study. Um, and I, I do just want to to take this opportunity to um, drive home the point that efficiency is so key, um, especially as you're you're looking as a building owner to your 2030 target. Um, focus on that low hanging fruit. Do your retro commissioning. I I, I saw some some stat that retro commissioning um, can can save you five to fifteen percent for like a very short easy payback. So. Um, those that is really going to help um save our grid or maintain our grid sorry good question great question 
Thank you, Becky. And thank you. That was from Matt. Thanks for your question, Matt. All right. Moving along back to the Q&A. And time check, we've got just about, just under 15 minutes left. So if any of you are itching to have questions answered, submit them in the Q&A, bottom right-hand corner, circle, triangle, square. That's where you find it. We'll work to get to them tonight. If not, future engagement Thanks. sessions where we hope to see you. So, And Sam, if I may, you know, I'd welcome folks to use the Q&A to give give an example of a of a webinar you'd like to see a training you'd like to see a resource um i mean you can obviously email me but if since you're here uh, i'd love to love to collect that data sounds good all right next one is do buildings over 35,000 square feet that are not fully conditioned still need to comply with BEPS. For example, a 40,000 square foot warehouse with 5,000 feet square feet of office space conditioned. Very specific. Um, this is actually, I think, more of a Sam question. I, I can certainly, uh, since he's over at M MDE, I'm certainly happy to take a stab though, but. I I'm happy to take that one and uh, thank you for that question. We appreciate it. So yes, building is over 35,000 square feet that are not fully conditioned still need to comply with the proposed BEPS regulation. Uh, so there are standards for approximate, approximately, excuse me, 90 property types, including warehouses that are uh, conditioned and not conditioned. So uh, I will drop let me, uh, I've got our draft regulation as a bookmark, quick access. Let me get that for you. All right. I'm going to drop the link in the chat to our recent uh, 2024 BEPS draft regulation. So there it is. Just release right. that. Slide. Sorry to make you do work for me, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all good. All good. So um, that, that link is to the July 15th draft regulation. Still kind of hot off the press, only a month ago or so. So um, in there, you can find the uh, proposed standards for covered buildings. And that is, let me just scroll down real quick. That starts on page six of that draft. You'll see performance standards and co compliance demonstration. Within that, you're going to see those 90 property types. You're going to see those... Uh, emission interim and final emission standards for those 90 property types so uh, you can find that in there long-winded answer but yes uh, unconditioned warehouses over 35,000 square feet excluding any parking garage area still need to comply all right um, and I'll I guess I'll just quickly take this as an opportunity I get asked the question a lot what's the difference between MDE and MEA um, I typically say if you've got questions about the regulations themselves, so is my property type uh, covered, um, ask, ask MDE. Um, if it's a question about kind of a, a resource or um, kind of ask MEA. Of course, we, we, we talk constantly, um, but, but just for a more efficient, um, you know, that I'd, I'd say, you know, that's how you funnel your questions, funnel your questions. Thanks for that, Becky. All right, and thanks for that last question. Let's keep moving. 10 minutes left. Get your questions in. Well, uh, if we can't get them tonight, we'll have them stored and we can, uh, or you can send them to us later. So and we'll also work to get to them in future sessions. So this one's from Cameron. How many existing buildings does Maryland need to reach climate positive every day to attain a Maryland climate neutrality by the state mandated year. I'm assuming the state mandated mandated year, we're talking the 2020, 2045 target um, rather than the 2040 BEPS target. Is that, um, um, but 
we're going to need all our buildings to, to reach to reach net zero. Um, so um, the climate plan kind of kind of sketches out the thinking behind that. Um, that was, I think, shared in, in a prior link. Um, and kind of going back to, to when I first started my presentation, I said the, the building performance standard was the impetus for creating the hub, but um, the hub goes beyond the building performance standard where our mission in, is to help all building owners. Um, doesn't matter if you're a K through 12 school that's not covered by the BEPS or you're a single family home, um, we wanna point you to the right resources. So um, come one, come all. Thank you, Becky, and thank you, Cameron, for that question. I just dropped the link to the Climate Pollution Reduction Plan. It'll take you right there, 100 pages, right at your fingertips. That's how we're going to meet the 2045 target. So thanks for that question. Okay, next up, let's see here. Lauren has a question. I lost sight of my screen. So per the tech tech guide, technical memorandum, and fines for non-compliance with benchmarking, larger or more profitable com companies may initially opt to pay the fine, potentially leaving the onus to benchmark on a smaller businesses. What is your plan to equitably support owners of all sizes and ho hold large buildings accountable? Great question, Lauren. Thank you for that. Let me, I might have to take that one. Um, and let me see. So I will just say that all covered building owners will need to submit their benchmarking reports. And uh, we encourage everyone to see our last two informational sessions for clarifications. And so uh, you can find those on the BEPS YouTube playlist, which we shared previously. It's in the chat feature. Um, talks all about uh, the benchmarking process and, and submitting data to the department. And we'll also have a September 10th uh, benchmarking and reporting working group at 1 p.m. Uh, where you can learn more about the benchmarking reporting process, specifically for Maryland's building energy performance standards. We're going to do a deep dive on BEPS data. So if that's what you're interested in, that's a great one to join. And that's September 10th at 1 p.m. We're going to record that and get it up on YouTube as well. So. Can I just add one one thing, Sam? Go for it. And I got a battery warning on my computer. So I'm going to go off camera, plug my computer in while you speak. So one second. Um. Just wanted to plug that um, HUD, so Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development, they have um, a new free benchmarking service for HUD-assisted properties, um, which I think is really cool. So, you know, Section 8 housing, um, a few other housing housing types. So um, one example of, of benchmarking assistance that, that we know of, poor and underserved. Um, building type. Thank you for that, Becky. And thank you, Lauren, for that question. If anyone was worried, I got my computer plugged in. We're good to go. <laughs> We're not going anywhere. All right. So moving right along. All right. Anonymous, what steps should I take to get started? Oh man, there's a lot of steps. I think. <laughs> wow, that's the, again. I feel like every question I could I could spend a whole webinar talking about. Um, so, energy audits, energy audits, energy audits. Um, an energy audit, in my humble opinion, is going to be kind of your your first your decarbonization roadmap. Um, so the industry standard is what's known as an ASHRAE audit. Um, and ASHRAE has three levels of audits, which, which vary in, in scope and depth. Um, all three are going to require preliminary energy use analysis, which 
involves a site visit where, where the assessor uh, looks at equipment, does a utility bill analysis, um, compares your building's energy use compared to similar ones in a nearby climate zone, um, et cetera. So um, the cost of the audit is, is going to depend on the level, so one, two, or three, um, size and facility type. Um, so note that like a hospital is going to have much more intense, a much more intense kind of audit process than um, a small business. And then perhaps the experience of the auditor. Um, just really quickly, um, what, what one, two, and three mean. Level one is your, your simple kind of walkthrough that focuses on low and, and no cost measures that um, the building owner can implement to reduce consumption. Um, usually adequate for small buildings with not sophisticated building systems. Level two, more detailed, and that's often really the sweet spot um, for audits um, that I that I know at least. Um, so this is going to be more detailed um, equipment inventory, detailed energy savings and, and costs associated with with proposed energy conservation measures. Um, financial analysis. Um, uh, yeah. So they, again, they're sort of the, the Goldilocks sweet spot. Um, they balance the sort of engineering rigor with, um, you know, being cost effective. Um, audits do unfortunately cost money. Um, and then a level three is, is your really detailed analysis, um, you know, detailed HVAC calculations, hourly simulations, um, and they'll even actually um, provide like a scope of work and schematics um, to help guide guide a contractor in the next step, um, et cetera. So um, level three audits, um, I believe we, we, in the industry they're sort of called investment grade audits, and um, they're typically they're typically done if if a, a building under um, decides to take on an energy savings performance contract, or ESPC as we cutely call it. Um, so that's packaged in there. Um, yeah, so, um, but we're hearing, I, I'm hearing a lot that, that there's a lot of questions around audits. Um, so we're going to create a step-by-step -step manual and kind of a toolkit of templates, um, to help you choose the best audit for your building type. Um, and then once you receive your audit results, that's when you kind of work on your financial plan. Um, yeah. Great. Thanks so much, Becky. All right. That's 759. We've only got a minute left and I've still got to say my remarks to close us out. Oh, wow. so, I'm sorry. We might have to close out the Q and A for the evening. Um, thank and you. Here I thought it was going to be a quiet audience. That was great. <laughs> uh, yeah. Thank you everyone for your questions. And uh, we will uh, make sure we we take note of these. If you want to uh, send them to our emails, feel free to do so. Uh, they're in the chat, or we will work to address them in future engagement sessions again. And just want to say thank you all for attending our third BEPS informational session, Clean Buildings for All, leaving no one behind. And a special thank you to Becky Price for joining us this evening. Uh, Again, everyone, our next BEPS informational session will be on September 10th, and that will be the first meeting of the Benchmarking and Reporting Working Group. So like I said, if you want to do a deep dive into BEPS data details, this will be the session for you. Do not miss out on that. If you do, it will be recorded. It will be up on the YouTube playlist. Um, but we hope to see you all there, and thank you all again for joining. Have a nice evening, everyone. Thank you all so much.